Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today on October 8, 2020. We are in the Jim Terry Learning Center on the Clarkston campus of Perimeter College of Georgia State University. My name is Lisa Alembic, and I'm on faculty in the Fine Arts Department. And I am so delighted to be sitting here today with my friend Martha Whittington. Now, Martha is a beloved artist. She has exhibited internationally and nationally. She has been to Berlin. Her work has been to Istanbul, Hong Kong. In the States, she's, her work has been in Texas, Florida, Tennessee, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And in Georgia, you may have experienced her work at the Museum of Contemporary Art, the Atlanta Contemporary Art Center, mm -hmm. um, White Spec at White Space Gallery, and Sandler Hudson Gallery among others. She has had, she's been on many residencies, including the Hambage Center, the Bema, Bema Center in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. She was supposed to be in France, but due to the pandemic, she was not, she's postponed her latest residency. Now Martha is a professor at Savannah College of Art and Design in the Foundations Department, and she is a perennial educator. She has helped me with my own teaching and my own work. And uh, her work, which we are gonna discuss today, you can see some in the gallery behind me, is just beautiful. Her work to experience it in person is, your body feels it. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about that. Cool. Welcome. Thank you, Lisa. So thank you for the great introduction and I'm going to give a special thanks to Georgia Perimeter for hosting this exhibition and also Valerie Hans and of course Lisa Limbic and the wonderful Donald Dugan who was so very, very helpful in learning to navigate this space. So I, I'm really honored to be able to bring my work so close to home too. So this exhibition is titled Winnowing's Daughter. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how it started? What, where, where did this concept come from? Sure. Um, December um, 2019, during my school break, it's like, well, what do I want to do? I, I'm, I'm not quite in the mood, the mood, to, to, to fly somewhere, and I wanted to have a, another kind of adventure. So I was like, well, where can I go? And I thought, well, let's take the Greyhound, of all things. So. With two close friends, we decided, let's, let's do the Grand Canyon. So we went on the Grand Canyon bus for close to 40 hours to, to, <laughs> to get there. And it, and it truly was, it was a magical experience. One, I got to see part of the countryside I hadn't seen since I was a child on road trips. Two, the people that I met. And one, I got to see the part of the states that we normally don't venture into. Um, the Grand Canyon choice for me was, I was really seeking inspiration and when I was an undergraduate and I was having, a, you know, I felt like my work was stifled and I felt like I was repeating myself. And one of my professors, um, Dan Yarborough, um, he said, you need to go find something so beautiful that it moves you. And I'm like, well, how do you do that? And, and in fact, when I did do as he recommended, it didn't just happen overnight. I was like, where's beautiful? Where's beautiful? Yeah. And when it did happen, I understood what he was talking about, that I needed to be in touch with something that was greater than me. Um, so the Grand Canyon, oh my gosh, it was, you know, as a child, I went and we stood on the rim and then we got back in the station wagon and headed to the next stop. This time it was, I got to experience it. It was during December, no one was there. We were like the three of us with the canyon to ourselves. And as artists, all of us, it became like this little art adventure for each of us from doing rubbings on, on the old wind-worn trees to using the snow to mix our watercolors and in the mud so that was the spirit of the trip was like it was opening me up again to 
what it is to be creative just for the joy. Um, something struck me then, and, and, and Lisa and I talked a little bit about this. Something struck me as we were moving through the canyon and, and we went to visit, it's called the Watchtower. It was designed and built by Mary Coulter with indigenous um, craftspeople, and it overlooks the vista. You can see every rim, and then you can see further off. It, it's so amazing. And when I was experiencing this structure, a couple of things happened for me. It was, there were uh, indigenous people, they were selling their goods, I thought. And I was, went to you know pick up a few, and I was like, oh my gosh, these, these aren't made by your hand. They're, they're made at a factory somewhere else. And I was struck by how, as people, sometimes we give up things about ourselves to, to be part of. And the work really, it didn't start out with like me just going to uh, weaving with, with a cane. It, it, it's kind of emerged from that experience. So these were people who were selling uh, trinkets. Yeah, touristy, touristy, touristy tri things that were from their own, should have been from their own culture, but were actually made outside of the states. Yeah, yeah, and, and it was it was sad, but it, it also became it was a point of reflection for me of, you know. What is what is what is my art personally? And you are such a crafts person. Person, you take so much pride in everything you make. You learn new, new methods for most of your shows. So to see this sort of process of weaving or what whatever objects you were looking at, not made by those people, really struck you. It did. It was it was kind of heartbreaking actually. <laughs> and so. You know, I went back to the studio, and, the, and it just didn't emerge that that had affected me so much until I started weaving these these vessels with a huge open weave. And so the first one you made is the large one that we see here. Uh -huh. And when you, what were you thinking of when you made it? How did that come to be? The first one, it was about a physical encounter for me, making something bigger than me and also a material that I had not worked with and as I was working on it it was like it was so important that it was almost human sized. I needed it to feel as though was it something that was protecting me or was it something that I would put things in from my life mm -hmm. but there was also a part of me that was looking at it as almost a filter as ideas and current events mm -hmm. were kind of as a sieve flowing through it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's bodily, like a lot of your work, there's a tension when I, when I step up to it, my body, I almost want to touch it. Someone was just here saying she wanted to touch your work. It was very tactile. Mm -hmm. And my body feels it and responds to it. And it does have this sort of filter with another filter over it. Mm -hmm. And it's a vessel, it's hollow. When you started to think of the title for the show, did that happen at that point, or was that later, this idea of winnowing? And, mm -hmm. and tell us what winnowing is. Okay. The title of the exhibition is Winnowing's Daughter, and winnowing is, it's a Saxton word. It is when you take your wheat or your grains and you throw and, sh and sift them in the air, and then the, the, the shape drops because it's heavier and I was looking at my my work and looking at the holes the spaces that I created not holes but the the spaces that I created within the work and I was like gosh it's like you know breath is is flowing through it we have a structure a definite structure a definite linear form but it's hollow and air is flowing mm -hmm. through and in my practice <laughs> in my practice, there is, um, you know, if you were able to look at any of my work, but you can see it in this work, there's an implied function to a lot of the work, like a tool that maybe you could use or, or maybe you saw someone use. So there's, 
it's this reference that we have in, in, in functional objects. And you are known for your tools. Mm -hmm. Your tools are, are part of your artwork. And what's interesting about that sometimes they're miniature, sometimes they're large, but they always connect with the body. Mm -hmm. It's this um, kind of a contrast of the sharpness and the careful quality that you craft your tool and then this intuitive feeling of how you're supposed to use it or hold it or how it connects. When I walk through this exhibit, I feel that tension mm -hmm. that these are supposed to be somehow used. When I first saw this piece, I think it was in your studio and on its side, and I just felt like it was something that would be weaving back and forth. Mm -hmm. And as I go through and see other works, I'm feeling that sort of spinning, weaving, Mm -hmm. There's a sense that the, how you have woven the wood, it, it's acting. And mm -hmm. we bring our imagination to it to discover what is the action, what is that tool doing. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the longer, and, and what is it made of? Okay. So th the work Elise is referring to is, it, it's a very long, and I, I'm sure it's on the screen now. <laughs> it's a it's a very long basket uh, basket form. It measures almost eight feet in length. And as I was making these forms, I was like, I don't want it to be just like I have a basket, which people are going to bring to this when they see that it's something that's over, it's interwoven and it's made of a material that we kind of recognize from seat from the seats that are woven to baskets, I wanted to make sure that it was like an interpretation of, of that act of weaving. So with the length of that one, and it was something we, we touched base on, which kind of goes with the hand tool, my interpretation of, of a tool is my own personal systems of measurement that I come up with. So uh, I, I love to think about you know, I do have rulers and everything's very accurate when you see my work, but a lot of that accuracy is from a little chip of cardboard or, or a string I tied knots in that I'm using to reference. And I'm like, okay, that measures three, three knots, so I'm gonna make this one six knots. And those systems, those units are, you know, when we talk about the body, they're also about how far I can stretch, how far I can reach. So they are physical, and when you're physically making something, it, it, something that's dimensional in space because it's existing in our, on our plane, it, it, at least for me, it is about me and my interaction all the way around it, above it, under it, that I am, you know, I'm exploring it. And so my body has to be a part of it. And I think there might be limitations because as far as I can reach, you know? So sometimes that might stop me on, okay, I can't hold these two things any further. <laughs> you know, it's like my arms are only so wide. So I guess that's gonna be the dimension. So in your past work, mm -hmm. I have seen you measure spaces, mm -hmm. use those measurements to develop your work. You're very site specific. Mm -hmm. You'll look at the environment and get, get a feeling of what shapes you see, and then you'll create something that's somewhat modular and responsive to that space. Mm -hmm. This work is different. Yes. This is responding to your body. Mm -hmm. It's a bit more, I'm, well, let me take a step back. You make the most exquisite models <laughs> and you build a model of this space. So it's, you are still working in a site specific fashion, mm -hmm. but I see this being so much about breath yeah. and counting and meditation, this kind of, um, and it's, it's almost like tying knots or um, saying your own sort of prayerful method. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, yeah, I, I think y you're absolutely right because in the past, the work is really in response to the environment and then I start playing with the scale of the objects that I'm considering. And since I am a process-oriented artist, I have a, a small concept when I start, a, a, just a, a flame. Mm -hmm. 
And then as I work, the materials really do reveal to me, oh, let me go research this. Let me go research that. If I'm having, you know, those happy accidents, it's like I made it work like that. And it's like, well, how, does it, how is that really made? And then I'll go look at it. Not that I'm copying it, but I want to understand the makers before me, too. Right. Um, but talking about, you know, when you were talking about these as, as a breath, and I also looked at them as when we were walking through the space earlier, and I was talking about two, uh, uh, I guess we can call it a diptych, the sisters. Um, I think each of these has a relationship to each other. And when I was working in this space with Don, it was like, what do we see behind it? So what is the the dialogue or what is the conversation a vertical work and a horizontal work have together. So I, I was looking at it formally, but also when we go back to the body, like the two with the red funnels, mm -hmm. it's like they're almost like arm, arm length. Mm. So going back to the sisters, which are over here, you have the tension between the two. Mm -hmm. And then you have this long bronze rod with this wonderful kind of spinning. You called it kind of a cleaner with the <laughs> little brushes. Um, that reminds me with all the sci-fi things I watch. Reminds me a bit of, of um, like somebody's um, cane or, or a powerful. Scepter or something. Yeah, yeah. And then but when I held it, because I was allowed to hold it, hmm. <laughs> and started moving it. It also reminded me of your piece, Gus S. Machina, uh -huh. at um, Mocha, Georgia, uh -huh. where you had a lot of movement, not just in the wood sculptures that you built, but in videos of people with their hands. You had performance. You had mm -hmm. sound. A lot of your work is collaborative. And here, okay. this is a show <coughs> where the viewer is your collaborator. Yeah. There's an, an artist, Olafur Olison, who makes these spectacular light-based works that are about phenomena. And I was listening to him, one of his talks with a, cla with a class I'm teaching, and what really struck me is he said it's the viewer's responsibility, it's our responsibility, not just the res of you, you know, to interact, and that doesn't mean you're playing with, with the work, but to interact, to be present, to bring to the work what you have. You know, so the artist isn't always the answer to the question. It's what you go in with when you're looking at the work. Mm -hmm. That's almost like a prompt in a, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So how would you, what do you want the viewer to come in with when they step into this space because <coughs> this is an installation. The individual <coughs> individual pieces are talking to each other, mm -hmm. and so as the person passes through, what would you want them to do? Gosh, my, my hope is certainly, you know, when you pass through the work, one, it's there's a remembrance that you bring to it. Mm -hmm. um, that. For example, none of the works have labels on it because I, I don't want my label to tell you, you know, what it's about. Mm -hmm. I want you, I want you to know what the concept's about, of course, but I, I want you to bring your, your interpretation to it, too. So, and that's also part of the placement. It's like how the heights I choose to, pla uh, choose to place my works. Yes, there's a lot of formal out element of standard, you know, correct viewing height, but I also try to engage you and pos posture you. So I want to posture the viewer to, v to look at the work. Mm -hmm. So you can't see it in just standing there, like with the twins, the sisters, you have to turn around to have the whole experience. And, and I think you were on, right on, you talked about the collaborative work and me working with dancers to activate my work, or before that, you know, I was a kinetic artist with big machines activating everything and you walked into the gallery and it's like ladders are standing and falling right before your eyes and and that was me controlling every aspect mm -hmm. of your experience and now I think maybe it's a maturity for me 
that I'm okay with you having some control when you view the work? So the first time I came into the gallery and saw it, I'm looking at your knots and I'm feeling the knot and I'm feeling the next knot. And then I started thinking, well, there's a f some kind of numerology or there's different, different numbers through the knots. Your cut felt, I started counting. Good. So that, that was interesting and that is intuitive for you. Yeah, so particularly with that, it, it is intuitive and it's also, and not to use a pun, but the thread through the work. You know, <laughs> the thread through the work. So, you know, we have three felt discs on one side, then you have six, maybe seven, maybe I decide when I'm stacking, ooh, you know, I don't like that those, you can divide by two and then like, let's add another one. But for example, the knots and you, the use of the red mm -hmm. as a vein, as a thread, mm -hmm. that it's kind of breathing or, or pumping the through vein. the work. Yeah. And so, for example, the knot tying, you know, that, that's part of the handcraft that I'm interested in. And that, that it's a tradition, but it's my interpretation of the tradition. And when we look at it, it's like you recognize, you know, is that a sailor knot or is that, so there's something with that. But because the knots that I'm exploring were functional, they weren't always decorative. And that's kind of important, you know, if you make the perfect square knot, which I love the perfect square knot, it's like there's a rhythm to it too. It's like you know when you have it right, when you pull it together and the tension's right and you look at the knot and it's like, yes. Mm. Then you can move on to the next. So with the, in, you're talking about the in, intuitiveness of it, mm -hmm. that is it. So sometimes you could almost close your eyes and it's like, can I do this with my eyes closed? It's like, yeah, I can. And that makes me think of the art of making fishnets. Yeah. Too, that very kind of methodical, but you know, and after a while it becomes part of your body. Yeah. You know, it's automatically. Sometimes it's not, you know, as meditative as someone might think, you know, there's, some t there's a lot of struggle mm -hmm. in, in trying to, well, learning, not trying. There's a lot of struggle in learning about a new material, you know, it's like, at what point is the material teaching you? And when do you, when are you open to that? When are you willing to say, you can only go this far, so I will take you this far. And then you might ask it, can we go a little bit further? <laughs> you know, and sometimes snap, no, I can't. <laughs> right, because the, the material, the caning material is really taut. It's a difficult material to work with. Yeah. That makes me think of your wonderful assistant, Selena Lilo. Yeah. And um, we have a beautiful piece by her back yeah. here. And she, she's had a hand in most of these pieces. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that relationship. I will. And, that, and that's part of the title, too. So we, the winnowing is a, is a very old work. And then daughter, when you're looking at the work, I, I hope that you see that, you know, a lot of the work is about a traditional craft that had been mostly a woman's craft. And so the hand stitching of wood to cloth, the, the weaving of a form that is basket-like. So with my, I'm not even gonna call her assistant, with Selena who worked side by side with me on this project it soon became, as she was working with me, it soon became about me passing on tradition, even though it might not be you know, a traditional tradition, it was the tradition that we were developing together. How do I sew? And it was so, it was so beautiful and amazing. I would show her and then she would do it and it'd be like, yours is so much better. <laughs> and I was so happy about that. But, you know, so there was this dialogue, Martha, should I pull this tight or should I do this? And it was, we, we worked so well together. And there was also kind of a, a, it was a, you know, when I chose to use the word daughter in, in the title, there became a very sentimental feeling for me as I was 
sharing how I, my process with someone, how, how I make. It was also very vulnerable for me because I'm a solo maker. No one hardly ever comes, you know, Lisa will come when I, you know, visit me. But my input is, you know, from a close network, but no one's in there with me as I'm struggling with my work. And so to be able to share that space with someone was really kind of, it was, it was a really happy moment. And I felt like, you know, it was a gift on both sides of passing on how something's made. And so with that, you know, with the winnowing and the, and the shift, sifting of ideas and form and elements through a space, it was, it, felt kind of natural that it was about actually two people kind of dialoguing as they're making this. Mm -hmm. And you are always giving your teacher to, to your students at Savannah College of Art and Design, mm -hmm. to your friends, to, you know, you're always giving. And you studied with Winifred Lutz at Tyler for your MFA mm -hmm. in graduate school, and you also did an internship with, um, Oh gosh, Anne I mean, Hamilton. With Anne Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And two powerhouse women sculptors mm -hmm. who both work with a, a variety of materials, whether it's earthen or performative. So you've come <coughs> from mentors mm -hmm. who have influenced you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Winifred Lutz, we'll start with Winifred Lutz. She um, site specific artists, a lot of. Um, outdoor work, she at our own CDC, she did a beautiful garden piece there with rocks. It's kind of located, it's very Marie Artemis and, and her had, you know, similar location there. And Winifred did on a hill at the CDC, she wove together, she braided together like a woman's braid, the grasses down the hill. So from her background of being very, very centered in her work, big work, big work, mm -hmm. but always so quiet with its voice. Um, it was an important time for me in graduate school with her. You know, any, any artist and graduate who has gone to graduate school, you know, it can be intimidating. It can be, you know, they break you down, everything that you knew before doesn't apply and Winifred with my struggles, you know, oh, I'm not conceptual, no, I'm not this. And she sat down with me and she said, let the work speak to you, the concept will come. And it's like, oh, yeah. And Anne Hamilton, much different, much different. She had an idea but she was so giving and explaining about how the process for her. It was laborious. We, we sewed horse hair oh, for three months yeah. in an unair-conditioned warehouse in Philadelphia, part of the uh, fabric workshop. Mm -hmm. And, but the idea of craft with her and those overlooked things, for example, the, the horse hair, but we can think about the Victorians and their small little brooches that they wove out of mm -hmm. loved one's hair. So there's this connection with all three women, three, I'm counting myself, with all three of us. <laughs> there <laughs> there, is, there's yeah. a connection with, not that the work's trying to be a, a, about women or, or a, just women's work, so you wouldn't say, oh, this is a woman's work artist, but it's elevating those. What, what is considered a craft. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking of the twins or the sisters and the canvas, which mm -hmm. is, you know, this really heavy, used for sails, really thick. And then you have these very delicate stitches going through it. Mm -hmm. It has a use. I'm not initially sure what the use is. It's almost, it, it reminds me a little of, um, Yoko Ono's po poetic uh, glass keys to open the sky, where right. you kind of look at it and you, you're wondering what it's used, then I think of breathing. Mm -hmm. So here's this heavy sail-like material, but then 
it's breathing and it becomes effervescent when you stand between the two. You physically feel that tension and the, the quality. It's just such a wide variety of qualities of women's work. And as I'm looking through the show and seeing the stitches combined with brass mm -hmm. and then the red, the heavy red thread, they're all in dialogue together. And the more I'm with it, the more I'm, I'm feeling it. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about the exhibit now that it's up and you've had time to, to be with it in this space? Yeah. Um, before I talk about that, I, I just want to talk about the materials a mm -hmm. second, if you don't mind. So, you know, when you're describing the brass with the stitches or a small little piece of leather, the materials that I do choose to work with, they have to, for me, have a historic kind of a historical um, or a history just a history to them mm -hmm. and looking at the the cloth the canvas I use the big sail cloth and I, I think about the tall ships and how heavy that mm -hmm. canvas was but then I started thinking about yeah but those were never perfect they were always repaired and they were always stitched and and I thought about this too not just about women's work but Handwork, for example, the sailors, and they were excellent knot makers. There, there are all kinds of beautiful collections of the knots that they came up with and the hand stitching of the sails. So I think some of that too, and it's great that for me, that's crossing now. It's not so much as gender oriented as I was before that I'm opening it up and saying this is more about, you know, our action to repair, our action to make, and, and using our hands. Yeah, I still, you know, there is that woman's work mm -hmm. aspect, but I hope that I, I am opening a little more. For example, along with the long, the long basket form, there's the brass tool you're talking about. And that brass tool is heavy. If you took it off the wall, it, it weighs a lot. It's solid brass that, that I am um, soldered and constructed and when I started like holding in the studio it was more weapon like at one point yes. and, it, and it felt a little aggressive to me mm -hmm. it felt that it wasn't at first about anything in the show that I was working on and then it circled back to where I started thinking about you know the big huge cast iron kettles and you know you're having to use your whole body yeah to stir so but with the with that um i guess i got well i i, I have to ask you about the nunchuck piece as yeah. you're talking about i don't think we have a photograph of that okay <coughs> that, so there's a, a piece that are these two long beautiful wood well well tell, tell us about that piece it's okay there's not a photograph. okay so lisa's referring to there's a, it's it's really a sweet kind of piece, but it, it's it's got a little nunchuck feel to it. So it's two long wooden poplar tubes that have rounded ends. One's shorter than the other. They're joined together by brass that I bent into a spring form. Then on each each cap where the where the brass and the wood meet. I did this stackage of wash of felt washers with it. So for me, when I was making that, I was really, I was really having fun actually, with how 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 tight can I turn the brass? You know, with my my personal little devices I make to do to make things. It's like the special jig I had to make and had to soak the wood so that when I added flame, you know, I wouldn't burn the wood as I'm bending around it. But that piece is almost like it's a, you think about, you know, rug beaters and things like that. So it has that feeling where maybe it was used to, or before we get whatever might go in these baskets, it's like I could also see it as like something that I would take out in the field and kind of knock the tops off of the weed or something. Mm -hmm. So, but there's also this tension in, in, the, in the size of it, in that spring. You see the metal stretched into the spring 
So it almost feels like if I touch it, it's going to spring open. So that makes me think of how different this work feels to me than, than your previous work. Because I've known your work for quite a long time. And I always think of, um, you did the corpse bog at Agnes yeah. Scott College, yeah. where you put insulation all on the bottom, of the ground that people had to walk through. And your work always has a residue to it. Mm. Some, something grimy or something um, that, that you really, you know, you feel it. It's, it's almost like the grease of the machine turning. Mm. This work is dry. It's as if um, it's the essence, or before the grease came. <laughs> yeah. It's the pure, there's something really pure and dry about it. Do you feel that? I do. And I also think about the forms I'm making, and it's almost like there's this full circle in, in, in the way I make, the forms I'm making. And I do, I feel that they're, they're, they're like paring down something to we only have one thin fiber that says what it once was. So, but I like that, that this is before it's dry, it hasn't been used. This is before it goes to the field or to the factory. And that gives, in that way, it kind of, it retains almost this shaker-esque quality that it's like, you know, one form follow, does form follow function? Right. But two, who is the maker? And that was kind of in some of the, the shaker makings, you know, if the hands are idle, then, you know, all kinds of things, bad things can happen. <laughs> so that they reached their own being through making. Mm -hmm. through that act of, you know, making it as perfect as they can with whatever tools they had. Mm -hmm. And you're using the caning is, is probably a similar tool that shakers would use when they're making furniture mm -hmm. and chairs. Yeah. You know, one thing I forgot was to mention to the audience, if you have questions, please put them in the chat because we will be answering. Actually, we do have a question. Do you have a question? Okay, cool. Um, when I when I enter a space, particularly if I'm looking to ex exhibit my work, I do spend some time in the space, uh, quiet time in the space, and not that I'm trying to say what were you about or anything like that. I want to understand how the light it, it hits the space. I want to understand the sound, even if I'm not using. Um, you know, audio with the work, there's still, that's part of the environment. Um, so I do take pictures of the work. I, I do do s uh, of the space and I, I do make models of the space. It, for me, it helps remind me of what it felt like to be in this space. So as I'm working, starting to work on a, on a let's just say a site specific place, for me, the digital representation doesn't give me a memory of the space. But if I have a little prompt, a little maquette, a miniature, you know, I can, like as working on this, on this show, I had a model in, 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 my, in my studio uh, of this gallery, and I would make quickly little teeny versions, and I'd put them in there. And it was like, okay, and then I'll move it over there. And I started to understand, too, the relationship of my work in the environment that it was going to, that it is living in now, particularly this space. And so it does go with me working with the maquettes, me spending time in the space, and then bringing something of that space back with me to the studio. So for me, it's not a photograph. For me, it's I had to have where I can miniaturize myself and be again in that space to understand how, if I walk around a corner, how much of the work am I gonna see there? So it's sighting too, but not me not being here sighting, and that's the exciting part, actually. So I'm working from the model, and I'm doing these sighting, thinking about scale, how will, you know, if you walk through, 
then the cat gets in the model and then it's like, okay, yes, it'd be great if I could have a giant blow up cat. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so I hope that helped answer the question. And that kind of segues into what I was asking earlier about how now that it's up uh -huh. and we've spent there time in here, uh -huh. what do you think of the work? How is it relating to each other? Is it how you envisioned it? Has it shifted? Yeah, there's, there, it is. There's, you know, of course there's some physical things with spaces that you, you can't change, but you, you kind of look at those not as obstacle, but how, how am I going to invite this space to work to house my work? And particularly in this space, it was about these little intimate chambers. And it took me a minute to understand that because I'm used to a gallery space being open. Mm -hmm. And then I'm creating intimate spaces, how I place my work in this big open space. This one had these little spaces. And I think that's part of why the work became so much not about, it's about the environment, but that's not the whole focus. It became about the relationship of this vignette with that vignette. What little surprise when you see a corner of one of the other works when you're like him since um, the red one and you see the ropes that are hanging and then you see the shoots on the wall. So through the little intimate experiences it leads you and then you get almost a, vis a landscape because I'm using the walls on the side and that was part of my process, it's like, okay, so we engage in this, but then how does it lead us? So going back to the original impetus for this work, uh -huh. originality, mm -hmm. your, your indigenous self, your, where you are, where your place is, and um, wanting to connect with that sense of a truth, mm -hmm. how do you feel this work connects back with that? For me personally? Yeah, yeah. I think that it's, I think that it's, kind of a, a pure work. And not to, I'm, not, I'm not saying that lightly. I, I think that it, it really is. I think that it's, you know, there was a lot of struggle, but there was also, there was some clarity. So I think that's where I get that idea that it was, there was this distinct feeling and vision I had. And it wasn't about what I had seen in other art. It wasn't about, you know, it was about the experience that I had on the vista of mm -hmm. the Grand Canyon, taking all of this in, and then it disappeared. Mm -hmm. And that makes me think, I mean, I'm kind of going to a different place, but it makes me think of the brass mm -hmm. and of the felt. You know, we talked about the sail material. Felt is something that you've come back to over time. Yeah. When I think of your materials, I also think of sound, very sonorous. And with this and um, with the title, with the openings, I keep thinking of wind and movement and that moving, yeah. moving throughout. Yeah. So is there a sense of satisfaction now that this is? Yeah, out? actually, in, in particular, you know, after the hunger and the tired or, you know, you're rested and you can see it with fresh eyes. It's like, you're like, that because works. From the materials, working, 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 and now it's up. Yeah. We're seeing it. People are online are getting to experience it. Yeah. yeah, there is a sense of satisfaction because it's materialized. And also, you know, when I look at it, you know, I can identify my hand but it also when I look at it, I'm looking at other hands that have made this before me. Mm -hmm. And that really kind of wells me up mm -hmm. with emotion when I think I'm not the first, I'm part of the line now. Mm -hmm. Were there other questions coming in? Any? Nothing at the moment. It's okay. No, no. <laughs> so what is happening now in your work? Are you <laughs> taking a break? I am taking a break. Um, I, I teach foundation studies at, mm -hmm. at Savannah College of Art and Design and Sculpture. And 
now I'm going to, you know, shift the focus a little bit more onto what my students are doing in this new way of working. And, and I think it's really, you know, it's important time for me with, with students as a, you know, you feel it too, that we're learning to navigate art in a different way. Mm -hmm. So as an educator and an artist, those two sensibilities weave I don't mean to be funny, <laughs> but they, they come together and apart. So what you're doing in the studio is often reflected in your class, not literally reflected, but your your ideas. I think so. And I, you know, it's it's I used to be, you know, when I first started teaching, I didn't teach for like fifteen years after my MFA because I didn't feel like I had anything to give back to give. And now it's it's much different, of course. That that you know this is so it's so exciting to watch as we see our young artists. You know, you see it start to the light bulb click, and then when they have experience like when we all first had when we turned around and we looked at our artwork and it was like, my God, that is beautiful. You know they're starting to have those experiences and it's it's like it's really magical it is so i want to ask a question about what is happening in the world today and how that relates to your work okay because your work is timeless but it's also timely yeah and um just thinking about breathing and the breath is something in the the wind and the openness mm -hmm. how do you feel about that you know, I think that, that that's a really good question, and I think you know, it does it does affect it does affect our work for sure. Some of us are going to be a little more literal. Some of us are going to retreat and have lots of reflection, and then it's going to seep out. But I definitely think there can be there are some connections with how we're feeling mm -hmm. in, in mass. Right, exactly. I mean, that's how I'm feeling, you know, when I see this, I think about our breath and how we're not able to share it. Yeah. And then there's something, too, about the transparency of the forms. They're not, they're not trying to be anything but that form. There's a truth to them. Yeah. And I guess that's where I used the word pure, but I, maybe truth would have been a, a, better, a better word. They're transparent, unlike yeah, what, 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 what we're facing what's now. in our world. And there's also with the reduction of, of, you know, extra elements with this work. My work has, for a long time, I think most of my life making has been taking away, taking away until just the essence is, is left. And relating this work into how we're feeling now besides the breath, we see their units. and like right now we have our units we almost have our own little tribes that we're traveling in so like the sisters or the twins and then we have another pair and then now we have three mm -hmm. so these groupings are almost like they're they're stand-ins almost mm -hmm. as we are in our little safe zone right the sisters are six feet apart yeah that's crazy we realized that yeah. when we were like in in the space yeah well, I want to thank you yeah. for exhibiting with us for, I mean, this is, this is amazing. Thank what you. you have birthed here in yeah, our space. I did. <laughs> and I want to thank you all for uh, attending and for helping us uh, have Martha here yeah. and so folks can listen to her speak about her work without actually being in her presence. So. Yeah. Thanks but I'd like, I wish us. we could be in each other's presence, for yes, sure. That'll happen again one day. I know. Lisa and Georgia Perimeter, thank you so much for allowing me to exhibit my work. You know, before we, before we go, as we were getting ready for the, the, the first round of this, this is when the COVID hit and we had to postpone the exhibition. And I think that actually that was important because I got to revisit some of my ideas and then I 
was able to use my studio as, as a point of reflection of and trying to make sense of what our new world was. And I think artists, that, that that's great that, that we can do that. Absolutely. And that artists can do that, that everybody can really take that time to, to think about what's happening in the world right now and where our place is and what we can do, who we can be. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.